the hot seat is all warmed up and we're getting into it this hour when we're asking serious questions about what is going on when it comes to these high fuel prices what it means and the question why did it take such a, a high jump to help us out with our conversation this morning, our guest is already seated. John Wambogo is here with us. He is a commercial lawyer and governance expert. And um, we're getting into that conversation in just a minute. Our live streams are up as you join us on socials this morning. And welcome to our audience on KTN Home, Karibuni Sana. All right, we're getting into it. John is already seated. John Wambogo, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Very well. Karibu Sana to the hot seat. Thank you. Hot conversations. Combustion is already the word that we're using this morning when it comes to fuel prices and the conversation that is happening in circles in Kenya. But as we get into it this morning, CT is going to welcome you with the Mwambi from Malawi. You ask yourself, what is Mwambi? Yes. A proverb. <laughs> yes, there's a gentleman who has taken upon himself to teach us uh, the language that is spoken in Malawi. I'm not sure w what language is it because I don't want to say it's Malawian because Malawi, like every other African country, has many communities and they all have different languages. Mm -hmm. But he will tell us because he can hear me speak. He will tell us which dialect it is or which language among the many languages in Malawi he's been training us in. A piece of incense may be as large as the knee but unless burnt emits no fragrance. Mm. Hmm. What does that mean to you, James? Um, well, <clears throat> a piece of fragrance emits no essence unless burnt. Mm -hmm. Well, it simply means, if I was to put it in um, a similar proverb, that um you know or an, an english equivalent it would be probably be equivalent to the taste you know the taste of the pudding is in the eating hmm. good you know the beauty of interpreting a proverb is that you can't be wrong <laughs> because you are telling us how that proverb relates to you so, so what then happens is we get a, a perspective we didn't have like that perspective i hadn't thought of yes. but now i have it mm. Mm. so when you taste it you'll know how it, when you eat it is when you taste what yes. it actually is yes. yes yes okay well how about that for a great place to jump into today's conversation that kenyans are tasting the heat of feeling the heat right now of high fuel prices and the very first question is that we've not seen such a large jump in a while uh, we're looking at close to 17 16 shillings in terms of an increase of fuel per liter whether it was diesel whether it was kerosene whether it was petrol um, and the first question is why did this happen with the numbers that we are seeing and why was it such a big jump let's get into it with that okay thank you very much CT and Ndu I think first, um, there has been a certain misconception mm. concerning the fuel prices and the jump that has happened over the last one year because mm. there are various metrics that are outside that are not directly affected by the increase in price. For your information, if you look at the price of crude mm. in August 30th last year and the current price of crude they are almost at par. It's $95 to the barrel. So has it gone up or has it gone down? It, if, you, if you look at the recent past. At, at the recent past, it's almost the same price. Yes. Because we are, uh, the Brent crude is going for between 95 to 100 currently. Yes. In August 31st last year, 2022, it was about the same mm. price, 95 So the question then is what has changed? What mm. has changed is primarily to things one is the exchange rate in august 2022 mm -hmm. was 118 shillings to the dollar Kenya shillings to the dollar mm -hmm. the current exchange rate to the dollar is 150 yes there is a change of about uh, 32 shillings mm -hmm. which in real terms would be about 27 percent that is one the second 
change is that if you look at the taxes that were on fuel in August of 30th last year and today, mm. there has been an increase of about uh, a net increase of about 5.5 percent, and it is principally because the VAT rose by 8 percent, but there was the railway development levy mm -hmm. that went down by 0.5 percent, and there was the the import declaration fee that went down by 1 percent. So in essence, the net increase was about 5.5 percent. So now if you look at those two factors and look at the increase in the price of fuel, which mm -hmm. was about 159 in August 30th, 2022, to 211, which is the current price, you will also note that the increase percentage-wise will have to be the same. 27% in a year? Yes. Okay. 27% because of the, the, the decrease in the value of the shilling. 5.5% mm -hmm. because of the increase in taxes on, f on fuel. Mm -hmm. That comes to about 32.5%. Okay, in terms of shillings, what yes. we're looking at here is yes. that there's been an increase of 52 shillings yes. between August 31st, 2022 yes. and September you know, 14th, right? Yes. September 14th, 2023. Yes. So there's been an increase of 52 Two shillings yes. that translates to 32% of an increase yes. from what it was. But the puzzling thing that you're saying is yes. that uh, the cost of crude per barrel remains at $95. Yes, it has not changed. So this is the mystery. Yes. Are we saying that the only reason why we are seeing this high increase yes. in fuel prices is because the, of the exchange rate? Yes, but the partly. cost of but partly yes. it could not be Actually, the whole to, thing. Not the whole thing, but uh -huh. to a huge to a huge degree, it's because of the exchange rate. Are we seeing that there's a fluctuation of exchange rates for countries where by the yes. cost of fuel has also risen? Because the narrative that's mm -hmm. being spun at the moment yes. is that crude prices have gone up around the world yes. we've established that not really at not least true. not for 12 months yes it's not yes okay yes. but we also know that fuel prices have increased country to country around the globe yes what could be the reason why we see this simultaneous increase of fuel prices worldwide yes yet yet they don't have an exchange or currency exchange issue in the manner and form that kenya has now, first, countries based on their priorities regarding the, the, the taxes on fuel will have different varying fuel prices. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. In the East African uh, region, Kenya has probably is the more, has more expensive fuel compared to Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. Why? Why? Mm. Because our neighboring countries have less taxes. Theirs is, is purely a case of having less taxes on fuel. Ethiopia has almost zero taxes on fuel and their fuel happens to be the cheapest. If you go to countries, some uh, oil producing countries in Africa, I'll give you a good example, Libya, Nigeria. Mm. Their price, they, they, they rank at the bottom in terms of their price ha is the lowest. Why? Because they produce it, they produce it, and in the, in the case of Nigeria, recently they have also started refining it. So they they are not incurring as much transportation costs. As and, well. and many would even argue that I yes. mean, even in Nigeria, for example, it's yeah. still too expensive. Right now, yes. we're buying fuel at about one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty shillings equivalent. Yes, and that's still too expensive. Yes. for an oil producing nation. Yes. According Correct. to, you know. Yes, Libya is the cheapest at 0 0.03 cents, mm. US cents to the dollar, mm. which is about 400, 400, 400 shillings and 10 shillings and 50 cents equivalent. So, now, why are these variables uh, happening? One, you can have, a, 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 as part of the wider government policy, that the government is trying to create a shift to fuel non-fuel uh, non-fuel locomotion that is basically hybrid vehicles electric vehicles and in the case of kenya that is actually if you look at the recent policy changes including we recently hosted the climate uh, 
uh, Africa Africa Climate uh, Summit, Summit yes. just about a week ago or two weeks ago mm. and uh, and Kenya is actually a leader in the climate change uh, agenda mm -hmm. now you have seen the president uh, have has been you know every other day he's talking about uh, having electric vehicles the, there is this uh, the BRT buses are going to be electric is in there are, there are no taxes actually on um, at all taxes have been uh, waived on electric vehicles mm -hmm. so what what is the government trying to do over time you can see a trajectory where the government is trying to have the country move from diesel vehicles and fuel basically fuel transport to electric vehicles or green or green modes of transportation in and fuel for basically for cooking because of the climate agenda because of the climate agenda uh -huh. that is one and also there are various health reasons i'll give you a good example for example paraffin has in increased to 188 and of course there's a huge outcry that people are saying you know paraffin affects the, the people at the bottom uh, ladder of the economy and it is correct but the question is are there cleaner and cheaper alternatives today in the country i will tell you yes there is we have ethanol which is being sold at 85 shillings per liter mm -hmm. ethanol for cooking for cooking stoves we have a company in kenya mm. that actually sells has about 1 million households on ethanol with ethanol stoves so the question is are there alternatives yes there are alternatives and is the government what is the government's motive in insisting on not removing the taxes on fuel because the the option that the government has is to reduce the taxes so that then that if you remove the taxes today the, the total amount of taxes on per liter of fuel is about 79 shillings yes if you removed that the price would come from 211 to about uh, to 20. 220. 222. So, 122. So, but then the question is, do you want to encourage uh, the people to use to continue using transportation that is not climate friendly? You know, if only that was the only issue. Yes. Because this issue of fuel yes. and the costs therein yes. are part of a much larger conversation. Yes. Because the moment you talk of fuel, yes. you would argue that it's at the heart of the cost of living yes. and the ever rising yes. aspects of it. Correct. Because you increase fuel, yes. you in essence increase the cost of everything else. Correct. So, and then there's the question. The believability factor yes. that this government seems to struggle with. Yes. See, everything that you have said, yes. if the Minister for Energy came and said what you've said, yes. and had been saying it for the last month, yes. this increase would have been received perhaps with a little less acrimony. Correct. But when they jump on your bones yes. with this suddenly increase, I mean, here you are yes. sitting, going about your business, then somebody just lands on you. Yes. Um, you first of all have to overcome the shock <laughs> and the horror yes. before you now start thinking rationally. Yes. Now, that becomes even more difficult because then there are all the other things that haven't gone away and they are affecting your livelihood and your living on a daily basis. Correct. So that's the unfortunate thing. So the logic behind the matter of fuel yes. is lost in all the other noises that are, have become a reality of our lives. Correct. And they are louder than the logic yes. that you are presenting. Very well. I, I do agree. And uh, one of the things that, of course, every human being will tell you, you know, a hungry man cannot wait for the price of food to go down so that he can eat. <laughs> <laughs> he has to eat today. <laughs> to live for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, equally, a child who is supposed to go to school cannot wait for the government to give uh, resources or capitation for primary schools or secondary schools or universities for them to go to to school if at that stage they're supposed to be at that level of schooling. Why? Because these things are time-bound. 
So there are some things <laughs> that perhaps if the government uh, prioritized would perhaps ease the pinch on the common mwananchi and perhaps then enable people to, you know, argue in a more reasonable or logical way. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, unfortunately, yes. a lot of our thinking yes. is emotional. What do I mean? Yes. The things that we find pleasing to us may not necessarily be logical. Yes. But emotionally they are satisfying. Yes. One of them is the perceived understanding that you have a government that is concerned about your welfare. Yes, correct. And how people expect this to demonstrate it varies. Yes. Okay? Now, the raw nerve that is universally felt in this country are matters pertaining to children. Yes. And schooling is at the heart of it. Yes. Whether it is university, secondary school. So when you hear that there's a deficit of 29 billion shillings yes. that the government needs to have forked out to learning institution and it isn't there. Yes. You then have a situation where you're fermenting anger on a completely different level from the citizens who are parents. Because they're thinking, but what on earth is this? Why? Yes. Because the narrative is, but we've paid our taxes. Yes. So why are we not getting the services that we're supposed to get? And we have done our, our share. Yes. See? Now, when you have all these competing conversations, yes. again, and something like the increase of fuel now heralds perhaps an even more morbid situation where you realize, I thought things were bad, but they're definitely going to get worse. Yes. Now, it, it's, it's a claustrophobic feeling. You actually feel like you're being crowded and you have difficulties breathing. Because there are too many balls in the air and they're all fiery. So you don't know which one to hold, which one to drop. I am of this opinion. Yes. Some of these things, it's not as though the government is doing it deliberately. My thinking. Yes. I think there are things the government is simply not able to do. This government. Correct. They, they, they are not. They, 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 they may want to. They may even try to. They're not coming out and saying it, but some things seem to have run ahead of them and it's slightly beyond them. And what they're doing is trying to play catch up with it. Because how do you explain a situation where every time you think something has gone all right, something worse happens? Just when you think you've gotten a handle of it and saying, okay, here's where we are. Mm. Yes. Before you came to the show, I was telling Ndu yes. how uh, my cab person, my Uber person, yes. was telling me yesterday that, you know, why don't these people just... Instead of this telling us 20 shillings, 30 shillings, why don't they just say it is 300 shillings? Yes. That's the cost of fuel. Yes. Until July next year. So we know between now and July, yes. we're dealing with 300. So we don't have to keep adjusting. You can organize yourself. You can organize yourself. You know it's, th you know it's 300. Yes. Right. Yes. Here's the thing, though, and I think this is what poses a bit of a problem, even though um, the, the general population will complain about the high cost of living, yes. will complain about this great jump that we've seen. I mean, look, a year of 52 shillings increment is not a joke. That's a lot of money yes. to have increased by in such a short period of time. Yes. All right. And we also know that the ripple effect of the increase cost of fuel on everything it doesn't matter even breathing is going to be a little bit more expensive in the coming days because mm. of this yes we can't run away from that we cannot also run away from the reality that taxes are necessary for the government to operate not to develop a nation yes. because look it has never happened there's nowhere ever that nations have developed on the back of taxes it doesn't happen yes I'm saying in order for government to run, taxes are necessary. That is, is established. Mm -hmm. Now, is the conversation that we are having today, because we talk about the fact that 79 shillings from your 211 shillings that you pay for fuel goes direct to tax. Are we talking about looking for innovative ways to reduce the number of taxes or reduce the amount in each box of taxes that would make things a little bit more palatable? <laughs> like who says that the particular levy has to be seven shillings why can it not be five it may sound like a minimalistic view of things but that's what we're coming down to is it possible that your independent power producers for example don't need to have this amount of money when we're talking about energy is it possible that your import tax does not have to be x number that you can reduce it a little bit so that across board we can see how it would become a little bit easier for folks to survive
Yes. Does that not make sense as a way to look at this? Because taxes are necessary for government to survive. That's the first part. The second part is that, look, we also understand that in order for you to feel satisfied, there's something it does to your, your being that these taxes that you talk about that need to keep coming are actually being put to good use, that they are effective and they, they are efficient. That's also a role government has to play. Because we can compare ourselves as African nations to whomever we like. But we're going to have to compare on each and every detail that where there are countries with high taxes, that there is efficient and effective use of those taxes and it can be seen. It's not heard. It can actually be seen. So here we are, number one. Is it possible to have a reduction across board? And then what can government do to make sure that effective and efficient use of these taxes is seen by Kenyans? Okay, I think uh, first there's something that uh, City has alluded to mm. in terms of the uh, latitude that the government has mm. in doing away with some of these taxes. I think partially because of the situation with our borrowing, I think the country was too indebted and the amount, the portion of revenues that we are spending paying the the debts the debts that are there mm -hmm. is squeezing out the amount of funding that is required to do a lot of the recurrent expenditure now we are in a situation where we are replacing more expense trying to replace more expensive debt with the Bretton Woods institutions we are now firmly in the grip of the west and they ha they obviously for any loans that they are giving you that they are telling you are you know are low interest rates or they are grants they come with conditionalities there's nothing like a free lunch mm. in the world everybody who gives you money gives you with their own conditions and sometimes the conditions may not be in the fine print it could be something else that you have to compromise on so the question is does the government indeed have that latitude mm. to do away those taxes because they, they are being told if for us to give you this, you know, financial support, to support your currency, to do this and that, you will have to, you know, uh, have these taxes imposed, mm. you know, because you have to show us your ability to repay. Of course, we know in, 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 real, in real terms, in practical terms, sometimes the revenues do not increase. When you increase the taxes too much, actually the revenues go down. Why? Because people then reduce expenditure. Mm -hmm. It's just no more human behavior. So you may not actually get your goal of actually getting the taxes increasing. People generally don't have an issue paying these high numbers. And, uh, and I'll explain. Uh, they don't have an, an issue paying these high numbers if there is a requisite action. So prerequisite, we pay. Requisite, we now say, all right, let's see that one, two, three is done. Okay, fine. I'll pay high prices. But within those prices that you're counting as taxes, there's levy one, there's levy two, there's levy three, there's levy four. That unfortunately doesn't translate to much. That folks are complaining. And, th and this is the thing today, that you see the high prices and the one, seven levies, I believe, seven taxes within taxes. that, that taxes. seven two levies two and two taxes, taxes. Yes. within that 79 shillings that all translate to something there's road maintenance there's this that the other thing inside there but you can if you were to go into the interior parts of just take nairobi what do the road network look like what do the roads look like and there's a levy inside there that's supposed to be maintaining these roads that's what it's for <laughs> right yes, yes. certain things are supposed to be happening I say Kenyans will not have an issue paying for these things if they can see the requisite implementation of the burden that they've had to pay from their pocket. But unfortunately, that's not happening, which was why my question was, what can government actually do to ensure that this money that you're paying that is so high is effective and efficient in its spending and implementation? Okay, thank you. I think... One of the things that first we have to appreciate is that indeed the government has a lot of wastage. We need definitely, without any doubt, a more efficient government. Why? Because, like I said before, there are some basics that if everybody had addressed, wouldn't the, 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 the cost in terms of the increase in taxes would be quite acceptable. 
I'll give you an example. In some countries like Norway, mm. which is an oil producer, their fuel per liter is the most expensive. Why? Because they have a closer goal to going green. Mm -hmm. And therefore they, do, they are trying to discourage, you know, vehicles that are fueled by petrol, by diesel, to electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, highways taxation is above 40%. Norway's taxation is above 40%. But you never see anybody complaining or any demonstrations. Why? Because education is free. Yeah. Uh, if you go to public schools, medical care is free. You will find, you know, good doctors across board all the hospitals are more or less at the same standard. So the average person, the amount of, out of his paycheck, the amount of money he spends on what would, should otherwise be public services, in Norway is very little. Whereas in Kenya, in addition to paying the high taxes, you still have to go back to your net pay to cater for what should otherwise be provided by in the public uh, for as public services. If we had a situation where, for example, and that is where I was I mentioned the issue of priorities. If we had a situation where the government was keenly focusing on ensuring all our primary schools, secondary schools, TVETs, and universities are properly funded. And that, that bridge of, you know, the poor man's child being able to move from poverty to the middle class through the education system. The education system has, for, for most of us who come from humble backgrounds, mm. the education system has been the bridge, you know, coming from low income to a middle income to a you know, a higher income uh, bracket. Mm. Now, if you cut that bridge, of course, there'll be a lot of dissatisfaction. And uh, genuinely so. And, you know, it's something that is reasonable. It is to be expected that it will be there. Because people pay taxes for the government to ensure that they have hope in life and that there is progression in the human development. So, that is a, one area that the government should give high priority to in terms of funding. The other area is health. You have situations where hospitals, NHIF, is not able to fund because of, again, fraud, you know, wastage, that kind of thing. Those are areas that should be, the priority should be given such that any person, whether you have money or not, if you are unwell and you go to hospital, you are able to get medical services. Now, we come to the last issue, which is the issue of food. Kenya still remains a food deficient country. We import a lot of our food from our neighbors, mm. uh, partially because compared to our neighbors, uh, our weather patterns have been more erratic. We, we, have, we still depend a lot on rain-fed agriculture, and we don't have good rains most of the times. So the government then, of course, that will have to be a long-term plan because it involves construction of dams, uh, mm. you know, in all the places that then people shift to irrigated agriculture. But in the meantime, one of the areas where you can subsidize is, for example, you know, just remove taxes on anything to do with food. Mm -hmm. Have that not tax. The farmers should not have any taxes. So that even if they pay more for diesel, then you can save in terms of the fact that, on the other hand, you are not uh, paying as much in terms of of taxes and therefore the f food prices, the price of maize, the price of uh, all the food items are able to, you know, to go down considerably. There are various interventions that can be done that the people do not feel, you know, the common person does not feel as much of a pinch yeah. with the increase in fuel prices. So I think the focus is it's really an issue of priorities where the government is focusing. I think you don't need too much, too many balls in the air, but you have to focus on the basics when times are, times are tight. You know, when times are hard, you have to focus on the basics. So, and that should perhaps, in my view, be the di direction that the government is looking at. Right. As the other macroeconomic factors stabilize. You know, the... I actually think that at some level, mm -hmm. the Brenton Woods Institution and the where to force notwithstanding, yes. the government... No, let me start with the president 
appears to actually intend to do good. Yes. But the thing that keeps puzzling me is what the competing interests are. Yes. Because on the one hand, you clearly have these interests and when one listens, one is convinced that this person wants to do good. Yes. Then you look at the people who've been appointed and you wonder now, okay, there's something hidden about these people whom I, I can't quite understand. Maybe he sees it. Yes. And then one year of this government's ruling and you say, hey, hey, God, hey. you just keep exclaiming because People are given positions of authority and the mandate is not difficult to understand. That's why it's called a ministry. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. And the thing is, there is no ministry in this country that has enough funds allocated to it for its activities. Yes. You do not see commensurate activities with the monies that you keep being told were allocated. Yes. You don't see. But what you do here in replacement of the activities, a lot of talk. It's like when one says something is going to be done, you're supposed to assume that it has been done, and yet it is clear it hasn't been done. So you're a bit lost. How am I supposed to assume it's been done and I can see it hasn't been done? And then, it's not as though the cost of these things go down. It's one grand project after another in word. Mm -hmm. Money set aside. And yet, for instance, now, we have been told El Nino is on the way. We've yes. been told, mm -hmm. okay? Governor of Nairobi is trying to dredge some of the water drainage systems in the city. There are plans to look into how people who are in the low-income uh, residential areas can be assisted. But you do not hear of a concerted government plan to deal with these issues. Yes. It's pockets. Yes. This group says this, and the group says this, this is what they're going to do. But a concerted government plan. The plans we heard were they were going to build 100 dams. Do we really need 100 dams? Do we? What is most required is a lot of rain, water pans, small reservoirs that can contain water. Yes. Those are easy to build, very, very easy to build. Yes. And they're even easier to maintain. Now, if you're going to have heavy rains, should this not be the time when you plan to harvest as much of that rain as you possibly can? Yes. But again, you have rivers they're going to overflow. Part of the reason why rivers overflow is that over time, their, their levels are filled with silt yes. as soil keeps going to the river. Now, I would have assumed you dredge it. Mm. Okay? Yes. So that when water arrives in these water bodies, on these passages, you are, they actually find enough room for them to do what they're supposed to do. Now, something as simple as that, you hear of money being allocated for hospitals. Yes. And you hear of big talks of building other hospitals. And yet, we have hospitals that lack commodities, lack equipment. So you're thinking, okay, why are we always planning to do big things and the ones which we already have, we have difficulties maintaining? I mean, there is a logic to it, but I, I'm the one who doesn't get it. I, 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 I don't get it. I would have assumed you sort what you have so that it is clear you've sorted it out before you move to the next. Because if you sort these out, the pressure to build a new one may not be as high because the service will be provided. This competing interest where the thought process and the intention seems to be interfered with with something else that is competing with this very same thing that we are saying. And it is constant. It is constant. By the time it is being felt by citizens in the country. And it's like they went together and had a focus group discussion and agreed this will be our thought process. Feeling our interest isn't actually being served here. Hmm. So, this big, so if we're going to translate that, this big yes. jump that we see, because we, we still keep coming back there. Yes. That the big jump has taken everybody, is we've lurched, and yes. we're like either lurched forward, but in this case, we've been taken aback and say, oh my goodness, it's, yes. it's been high, yes. but it's never been so high, so fast, and by so much, right? Yes. If these things, that's, th why is there a competing interest then? It should be that, all right, it's so high because, look, that's what we're forced to do because of, you know, fluctuating interest uh, exchange rates, number one, currency uh, rates. But then also the taxes that we then um, have put in here are for a reason. Yes. If we can actually see 
where this money was going in terms of implementation. And maybe my only point today, if we can actually see where this is going in terms of implementation, could we then get to the point where we say 300 shillings even is okay? 300 shillings is okay. If you can say that if a, if a third of that is going towards tax, which is what is currently happening now, if it's going towards these levies, these taxes, whereby we're saying certain things need to happen, then it is all right. But why it is not all right today is because people cannot feel the effect of this burden on their shoulders that they're currently paying for. And how can that be fixed? How can it be fixed? <laughs> now, <laughs> I think uh, the first challenge that uh, we have yeah. with, with with the current government from my own observation is that uh, they seem you know the various government departments seem to be working in in silos there is no coordinated effort like what city has just mentioned mm. and as a result you find a situation where policy initiatives you know the president who by all means i mean is a very intelligent man and a very good politician will say something which is what he he really intends to do mm -hmm. remember i think uh, one of the things that as kenyans we have to come together and come to a consensus is that uh, once somebody is elected to the position of president it is in all our best interest to support that person mm -hmm. to succeed in their initiatives because if they succeed then we all succeed. Our lives become better. Mm -hmm. All of us. Uh, and if we are to criticize the government or, you know, assist the government, we have to give alternative solutions. That might perhaps work because the challenge that we have seen, and that is why you, sometimes you see even the communication from public officials in the recent past has been at conflict and, you know, and people are wondering, why are you saying something like that? Mm -hmm. Because we have given you a job. Why not give us solutions or give us possible proposals of how you are going to deal with it? You know? Why do you talk back at us mm -hmm. and tell us that, you know, fuel, in fact, is continue to conti going to continue increasing <laughs> by such a percentage every month? <laughs> you know? I mean, that's not the way you address the situation. Mm -hmm. The real uh, way to address the situation is that you have been given a job. And your job is to actually fight, fix the issues that arise. Right. Every generation has its own challenges, granted. And they ha every generation has got that mandate to address the challenges that they are facing at that point. So now going back to the, to the, to, to the issue here, the cost of living is the, at the bottom. You know, it's at the heart of the matter. The increase in fuel leads to an increase in all almost all consumer goods because all services and mm. services mm. because our transportation is largely based on that we still have an energy sector that we are still talking about high power bills yeah and the funny thing is when we talk about those thermal, uh, thermal power plants that are also using diesel we really don't need them because we have enough geothermal reserves we have enough wells that have been dug that have not, do not have power stations, even as we speak. And we are told it's because already the capacity to absorb the power is not there. Now, high cost of power in itself is a major reason why we are losing our manufacturing, our industrial base to our neighboring countries. Mm. Because the cost of power is so high that the cost of producing manufacturing comparative to Egypt and other countries in the commercial region and the East African region, then it, we become uncompetitive. Yet, if we simply address that we have enough resources in terms of energy, hydro, solar, wind, and geothermal, we wouldn't actually need to use any thermal power plants. Remember, that cargo that we get every month of fuel, some of it goes to fueling those power yeah. stations. Yes. You know what is interesting? Huh? Yeah. These um, diesel-run uh, power generators, yes. at the time when they were brought in, they were very needed. Yes. Because we, we used to have power blackouts like you, you wouldn't believe. Yes. But in reality, have they not served their purpose? Exactly. Because now isn't then. Yes. 
But yet again, part of our, our social uh, engineering in this country is like you maintain the status quo so that you can start your own status quo. Mm. Yes. These are privately owned businesses. And they have contracts that have... We are being strangled by this. It's like a chokehold that yes. they have. Yes. And you wonder, surely, if we were to breach some of these contracts, what, what would happen? Okay, we'd be taken to court. And then what would happen? The money that we would save by not paying for these things, would we, that not be a saving that if indeed we needed to make compensation, we could say, look, folks. So there's no appetite for development? There's no appetite to take these numbers? There's no appetite to no, take these extra shillings it, it, towards it, development? It's a part of, I scratch my back, you scratch my back. They, it, it, now, this is one of the things that is daunting, mm. okay? It is not something that requires some ingenuity. It's just a question of observing the question, the eternal question, why is it that we still have just about the most expensive power producing units and again, not climate friendly at that and they're the ones which we tend to use most, which means they're the ones which cost us more and yet we have options. It's, see, this is the whole thing. We actually have options. By the time a country is being touted as one of the leading lights when it comes to renewable energy, energy. that isn't a small thing. Mm -mm. Globally. Eh? And yet, we keep paying that expensive price for the expensive power that is generated by these units. So, when you look at that is when you say, there doesn't seem to be the will to actually do what ought to be done. Because in all honesty, why not bite the bullet? Actually. And just actually get it done. Yeah, why yes. don't you just bite the bullet? From a governance point of view, yes. why would it be so difficult? Because the understanding or the assumption is that from a governance point of view, yes. trying to then be able... So certain things happen that you make the country governable, yes. right? And that you govern in a manner that is going to be acceptable to the livelihoods and, you know, uh, desires of your people. Yes. Right? Yes. At the very basic minimum. Correct. So if you see that there are certain factors which will enable you to do that, what would then be the thing that stops you from moving towards that place where you're doing that same thing? I think in response to that, and I will say it in the simplest way possible, Kenya has had a challenge with what is referred to as chronic capitalism, literally from independence. We have a situation where we have an unhealthy relationship mm. between the political class and the business class and a lot of, you know, uh, intermingling and I don't know how to call it you incestuous can, relationship. Yes, you can't mm. actually extract, uh, extricate one from the other. From yeah. the other. Yes. That the owners of the big uh, businesses, these power stations, power producer, power producer, in fact, if you look at many of those thermal power producers, you will find that the shareholders of those companies have either been in the past PSs, CSs, leading politicians. In that ministry. In the that ministry. In the parent ministry. In the parent ministry. Okay? And then it gets to a point where come election time, then these guys know, oh, a new, a new team of guys might be coming around. They finance... The political parties, the political parties come, they come, you know, blowing very hot. We are going to address this. We are going to do away with those thermal gener power generators. Then they get into power, and after about a few months, it's silence. That fire is extinguished. Hmm. That fire is extinguished. So, what is the magic? What is the magic? Yes, that is there happens. a wand? Yes. Is there a bottle somewhere with a genie inside that we must rub for something to come out? What? <laughs> What exactly? No, and I it, think that's it, the question. Yes. It, it, is, it is one of the tools that colonialists use for the longest time. Yes. You incorporate people. Yes. You get them to join you. Yes. And when they visit this promised land that you're in, they realize this thing isn't... <laughs> it is much better to be here than to go around opposing this thing. So, mm. you yes. join. Yes. So, in your last words, James. Yes. Um, in your last words, James, so what would that be? What is it that... So, we need to all be thinking about yes. going towards the place where we say, even if it does go higher, yes. this is how we can maintain. So I think first and foremost, uh, in terms of uh, our, our leaders, they need to realize that 
it would actually in the long term be beneficial if everybody got you know fair treatment in terms of how the governance of the country you know let no one be secret in terms of their investments just like for example the president has really tried is still really trying to crack down in the sugar sector even in the power sector there need to be a serious shake up so that those costs of power are brought down because one that will address a lot of uh, a lot of uh, costs that relate to the manufactured products that Kenyans have to buy there would be a reduction in cost if that could be addressed secondly we need to focus on the president is, is is right in saying that we shouldn't be subsidizing consumption mm -hmm. we should be subsidizing production indeed James Wambogo, commercial lawyer and governance expert, thank you for being here with us this morning. I mean, the conversations that we can keep having and keep opening up in terms of what needs to happen. One thing is clear, there needs to be an engagement across board yes. uh, for there to be a clear understanding of what's happening and how some things can actually come to change. Thank you for being here with us this morning. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.